And one of the biggest areas of focus for product innovation is, of course, new product introductions. It's where the bulk of research and development funds are. And historically, although it's gotten a lot of the investment, it's really not had a huge impact on earnings or revenue uh, in the year one, year two, after new products are launched. Maybe it's one, maybe it's 2% of revenue. Uh, but there's always been a strategic advantage to being first to market because you get brand recognition that usually leads to long-term market share. But that situation has been changing rapidly in the past couple of years as we've introduced new devices with short life cycles like tablets and smartphones. The amount of revenue to be generated in the first couple months of a new product launch can be upwards of billions of dollars, which has got companies focused on this. It's not a new problem. It's really been a problem in the toy and the video game sector for a while. You think back even to the 1980s and the days of Atari. Believe it or not, there was a time when Atari was probably cooler than Apple is today. Right? And everybody had one of their 2,600 game consoles. And they dominated the market with 80% share, well above Coleco and Activision and Intellivision and all the other products in the market. But Atari ultimately had problems with demand forecasting. In 1981, they introduced their popular Pac-Man game. Um, but they uh, overestimated demand. They only sold 7 million units of the cartridges. They had estimated they were going to sell 12 million, so they had a considerable amount of excess. Problems got worse when E.T. came around. Um, of course, the, the movie at the box office was, was a smash. Atari went and negotiated rights with Steven Spielberg to be able to develop a unique game based on the E.T. theme that they would bring to market. Um, they only had a few months to do it, and so they rushed the product to market. And it, needless to say, received some considerably unfavorable reviews from the consumer population who thought the graphics quality was low and the uh, interactive features of the game were difficult. But forecasting video games, DVDs, music, products like that are particularly hard because demand goes from zero to maximum on the day of launch. And in many of these segments, 60 to 80% of the lifetime sales of a product will occur just in the first couple weeks after it's launched. So if you get it wrong, you underestimate, you have a, mass, a massive uh, revenue opportunity that you've foregone. So Atari, when they made ET, massively overforecasted it. Unlike Pac-Man, there wasn't an arcade version of ET, so they really didn't have anything to go off of in terms of how popular this game was going to be or to get feedback about it. Now, what's probably more interesting than the, the overforecasting is what ended up happening with the extra cartridges. So Atari has never confirmed this, but industry insiders will tell you that they took 14 truckloads of shipments from a plant in El Paso to New Mexico, and they buried them underground and crushed them and put cement over top of them. So when you hear about these UFO sightings in New Mexico, you can wonder if maybe it's some of the ghosts of the space invaders and ET games that are buried in the desert out there. Probably the best new product launch of all time, which by many respects was a failure, what to do with the Star Wars franchise. So back in May of 1977, when the Star Wars movie was first introduced, no one was, was expecting it to be a success. It was over budget, it was delayed, even the studios that were backing it really were questioning how successful it was going to be. Now, a small company named Kenner had gone and negotiated the licensing rights to make merchandise around Star Wars, but like everyone else, they didn't think the film was going to go in well at all, so they didn't bother to make any merchandise for the launch. Of course, everyone was wrong. It was a smashing success. People lined up around the block just to see the movie, and they went back two or three times dressed up in various different costumes. The problem Kenner had, of course, which was a good problem to have, was they had exclusive rights to the licenses, but they needed to get merchandise to market. When you start in June or July of 1977 and try to get a product to market in December it was pretty challenging because back then it would take 12 months to get the molds and everything set up for these action figures. So what they did was relatively ingenious. Instead of actually getting the action figures to market, they sold people a $16 cardboard certificate that said, you can buy this in the store, put it under the tree for your kid, mail it in, and 60 days later, when the products are actually available, we'll mail you Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, R2-D2, and Chewbacca. And it was an amazing success. People bought them by the millions. They ended up selling 42 million action figures in the first year after the Star Wars uh, film was originally introduced.